There's a really common idea in the world of jujitsu, and that is that if you're a student, you shouldn't go to your instructor and ask, hey, am I getting close to my next belt level? I'm wondering how I'm doing. Because the one thing you can be sure of is that you're not gonna be promoted anytime soon for asking that. Now, I don't know how true that really is. Uh, I don't have that philosophy. I have an open door policy. If a student wants to come and talk about their game, I'm happy to do that. But maybe that's not universal. And as a result of that, white belts always have questions. Am I doing the right things? What should I be focused on? What should I be drilling? What should I be uh, doing while I'm sparring? What should my mindset be? Uh, what should I be watching in terms of supplemental jujitsu material in order to get better? And so on. So I thought it would be fun to see if we could answer some of those questions and arrive at a working definition of what is a blue belt. So what does it mean to be a blue belt? And before we begin, if uh, you like content like this, be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. And if you're a jujitsu practitioner, especially if you're over the age of 40, I have a course called BJJ Old Man Style that will help you develop strategic and technical solutions so that you don't have to rely on your physical attributes as much. And that course is currently 50% off, coupon code in the description below, and you'll be supporting this channel in a really direct way, and I appreciate it. So what is a blue belt? And first of all, let me say that if you are a white belt in jiu-jitsu, you should congratulate yourself because you're doing something difficult. You're doing something that very few people in the world have the resolve to do because it's very hard. You walk into class knowing nothing. Uh, the analogy that I like to use, I've, I always use this with my own white belts, and it's that you walk into a jiu-jitsu school for the first time and the instructor hands you a toolbox and says, welcome, here's your toolbox. And you're excited to see what's in the toolbox and you open it and there's literally nothing in there yet. And the truth is you need tools. You need tools to be successful. If you're a carpenter, you need tools. If you're a mechanic, you need tools. And eventually, if you train long enough, you will assemble your favorite tools and you'll become very, very skilled with those tools. But when you're a white belt, you don't get to be the hammer yet. You have to be the nail. And so there's a certain amount of resolve and determination that you have to make just to be a white belt, knowing that you're gonna have a lot more failure than you are success. And in fact, failure is something that will follow you through your entire jujitsu journey because it's a live art. You're always testing yourself against skilled opponents of varying levels of skill. And you will tap far, far more times throughout your jujitsu journey than you will get the tap. Um, and that starts to change eventually with skill. Your ratio of taps versus being tapped begins to shift, but it takes a long time and it takes a lot of training to get there. And when you're a white belt, man, you just have to embrace the suck, knowing that it's temporary. It's temporary. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu gets progressively more fun the longer you train because eventually it becomes a game, right? That's all we're doing. We're just fake killing each other and it's just a game. Can I, can I be craftier than you? Can I be more technically sound than you? Can I be more fundamentally sound than you? Can I develop better timing and better sensitivity and better fluidity than you? And that becomes the game at White Belt. You're early in that journey and you know you got to eat your vegetables for a while you don't get to go to the dessert so first of all congratulate yourself because what you're doing is difficult um can we quantify what it means to be a blue belt in jujitsu what does it mean well the classic definition the brazilians have espoused this forever and that is that a blue belt is someone that can defend themselves fairly convincingly 
against an untrained opponent, even that if that opponent is bigger, stronger, faster. Right? If you're a blue belt, you should have enough skill to defend yourself. Someone starts getting crazy at the airport, you should be able to take them down and dominate them, control them till someone shows up. Now this assumes there isn't wild disparity in size or strength. This assumes that you're not dealing with multiple attackers or knives or other variables, but a blue belt should be able to defend themselves. Now I agree with that. I agree with that definition, but in a sense, it's not really a definition because how do you measure that? How do you quantify that? You, you can't tell your four stripe white belts, hey, uh, go to the bar tonight. I want everybody to pick a fight. And if you win your fight, you're gonna get awarded a blue belt. You can't really do that. So there has to be a, a, a better metric for determining what a blue belt is. Well, in my opinion, a blue belt is somebody that has basic competence within the fundamental curriculum. Okay, all the, the bread and butter stuff that are considered foundational jujitsu. Uh, and it starts with escapes. Can you get out of bad positions? Can you get out of side control? Can you pass the guard? Can you escape the back if someone has you controlled from the back? Um, can you escape mount if someone mounts you? This is the foundation. The foundation of jujitsu is defense. Uh, this goes back to Elio Gracie. Elio in his 90s was still playing jujitsu, but he was mostly just defending. And that's the foundation of jujitsu. Can you defend yourself? And so one of the things, one of the answers to the question, what should you be working on as a white belt? You should be working on your escapes. Uh, with my white belts and in my lineage, I, I'm uh, a black belt under Roy Dean. Roy Dean is under Roy Harris. Roy Harris was one of the first to really codify what it means to be a black belt um, in, in an objective sense. And one of the things that we value a lot in our lineage is the idea of defense first. You have to be able to escape bad positions. If you can't escape bad positions, then you're in for a long, day or a long night or you're in for you know a bad encounter and so you should be able to make a lot of progress during your white belt journey of learning to uh, escape bad positions learning to get real comfortable in disadvantaged positions you know I've seen many many white belts early in their career tap out just from the pressure. Someone puts them in side control and really pressures them, they tap out. Because they're not that tough yet. The journey will toughen you. You will get very, very comfortable being uncomfortable. That's one of the things about jujitsu. By the time you get the black belt, man, I have been smashed and smashed and smashed. And honestly, it's no big deal. Eventually, it's just another day at the office, right? But when you're a new white belt, it feels intense. And so one of the things that you can do is get yourself comfortable. When you're in a bad position, don't just go crazy. Don't spaz out. Don't just use all your strength and muscle because the truth is getting out from bad positions is complicated and it's difficult and it requires a technical approach. It's not a strength move. How many white belts will just try to bench press you off and you end up getting arm barred because you tried to bench press off that person who was more skilled than you? That's not the right way to escape. You need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You need to learn to configure your body in good structures, good structures that give you a mechanical leverage so that you can then give yourself a reasonable chance of escaping. You're not gonna master this at white belt. And in part, you're not gonna master that because the better you get at escaping bad positions, the better your uh, training partners will get at maintaining those dominant positions. And that's the flip side, right? Defense, the flip side is offense. And so there's always the perception that you, uh, you're not getting any better at these things. Well, you are getting better, but your training partners are getting better too. And by the way, let me just say for the record, if you're a jiu-jitsu student, celebrate not just your progress, celebrate the progress of your training partners. We can't train alone. Yes, jiu-jitsu is an individual sport. Um, you're only in competition with yourself 
ultimately, and it's important to always keep that perspective, there will always be people that are better than you. There will always be people that have your number, right? But you're not in competition with them. You're in competition with yourself. So embrace, uh, you know, uh, celebrate your own progress, of course, but celebrate your, celebrate your training progress partner's progress because it's their progress that is pushing you to get better and better and better. The better they get, the better you have to get. So defense before offense. Um, once you internalize this idea and begin really focusing your efforts on that, the next step is to learn to control people from those offensive positions. And we're really talking about the basic positions in jiu-jitsu, mount, back, side control, guard, uh, maybe knee on belly, very common position, maybe half guard, very common position. And those are really the positions that you're gonna be in most frequently. Uh, open guard as a white belt, not so much. Closed guard becomes uh, pretty common. Uh, you, learn, you have to learn how to control people from those positions. Everybody wants to get the tap. Everybody wants to get the tap. And in a lot of ways, the way that we gauge our progress in jiu-jitsu is, did I tap out my opponent? Uh, and the flip side is, did they tap me? And so you're, these are the metrics that you tend to use, but getting the tap is a really terrible metric when you're new at jiu-jitsu. A much better metric is, was I able to control that person from a dominant position? You know, I recommend to my students, my white belts, don't be in such a hurry to get the submission. You know, you, how many times do you lose the position you're in because you enthusiastically go after a submission and you do it without control? There's a, an axiom in jujitsu that is a really great rule of thumb, and that is position before submission. If you just go for the submission, your finishing rate will be low because you don't have control. You need control at minimum of the major, uh, the major joint connecting the, the torso or the, the body to that thing you're attacking. So if you're attacking the arm for an arm bar, you better have control of the shoulder line at minimum. If you don't have control, then those escapes become much, much easier. So don't be in a hurry for the submission. Spend some time paying attention to how your training partners are getting out when you try to hold them down. And then like a good scientist, start figuring out, okay, what can I do to thwart their escape sequences? And so you learn to control someone positionally. You learn to transition when you're no longer able to control someone from that position. Don't hold on to it too long. That's a really common thing. Someone's holding on, holding on and the person's already escaping and you're not adjusting. So the next step is to adjust so that you can always go to that next position. If they defend, you have that next thing you can go to. Now that's more advanced, obviously, and it's not something you're gonna master as a white belt, but that's really the, the mentality that you need to have. I'm gonna dominate you physically, positional control, eventually as your skill improves, becomes positional dominance. And that's when your attacks become far, far more reliable. So don't be in a hurry to shortcut that and go straight to the submissions because your finishing rate's going to be really low. At white belt, you are laying the foundation. You are pouring the slab and hopefully you're reinforcing that so that you have a really good foundation to build a jujitsu game on. If you just go straight to submissions without the positional game, well, you're not gonna be very effective uh, in the long haul. So those are the major things you should focus on. And of course, you need to be learning all of the techniques, offensive and defensive from those major positions. You need to learn your arm bars from guard. You need to learn arm bars from mount. Uh, and if you think about it, by the way, uh, the mount is just the closed guard from another position, mostly, if you think about it. You're on your back, you have someone in guard. If you put them on their back, now you're in mount. So a lot of the stuff that you can do from guard, you can do from mount. So you should know arm bars from guard, arm bars from mount. Straight arm bar, Kimura, uh, Americana. Um, you should know chokes from guard, cross collar chokes, palm up, palm down chokes 
guillotine choke, triangle choke. You should know most of those things from mount, how to set up triangles from the mount. You should have some attacks from side control, although side control is not always the, the best position to attack from. It, it, um, when you're new at jujitsu, it takes some, some skill to be able to, to set those things up from side control, but you should still practice your attacks from side control. You should have attacks from the back. You should be able to arm bar people from the back. You should be able to choke, right? Rear naked choke, a bow and arrow choke, you know, basic bread and butter stuff. Those are the things that you should focus on. Resist the temptation as a white belt of always seeking out those secret techniques, those novel techniques, those sneaky techniques that your training partners don't know. When you're new at jiu-jitsu, you're desperate to have success. And, and the people you come up with, that you're neck and neck with, right? Some days this guy gets the better of you, some days you get the better of them, and you're constantly back and forth, right? Those people that you come up with, those are the most epic battles in jiu-jitsu. Um, there's a temptation to try to find stuff that they don't know. You know, we're all learning the same stuff in, in class. I'm gonna go to YouTube and I'm gonna learn those, those sneaky techniques so that you can, can come in and have some success against those training partners. But the truth is, the reason why your finishing rate is low against your training partners is because you haven't mastered the setups yet. You haven't mastered the ability to operate within the windows of opportunity that they're giving you so that you can position yourself in those moments when it makes sense. You haven't developed the, the timing yet. What is timing? It's two things. It's sensitivity, that there's a moment here that something could happen. And it's the rec so it's recognition and then it's reaction, being able to react with that thing that's gonna give you some success in that moment. And you have to train your body to make those movements. It's not a thought process. You have to engage your mind when you're learning jujitsu, but you have to disconnect your mind when you're sparring in jujitsu because your body needs to react. The old saying in combat sports is true. If you're thinking, you're late. And so developing that timing so that you can feel when that window of opportunity is opening and then closing, and then being able to react in those moments, learning to exhibit enough control, learning to not be so one-dimensional in your attacks. If you telegraph exactly what you want and every white belt telegraphs everything, you're just, I want that arm, and you're gonna go after that arm with 100% intensity. That's not the way forward. The, the, the skilled practitioner doesn't telegraph anything. I, I was rolling with Clark Gracie the other day, who is world-class amazing practitioner he's very young in his 30s he's you know at the top of his game incredible that guy didn't telegraph anything in fact he would lull me into thinking that i had a pathway because it was really a trap and you know operating at a very high level of skill and so that's what you're trying to develop and so um the earlier in your journey as a white belt that you can begin thinking okay i'm being really one-dimensional in my attack how can I set this up? How can I sweep this person? How can I attack the neck and then sweep them, right? You distract and you sweep. And you know, these are complex things that take a while. Uh, specifically, what do I think you should know as a white belt? Uh, well, I can't speak for all instructors. Everyone has slightly different, you know, ideas about this stuff, but in my view, you should really understand those four primary positions, guard, mount, back, side control. And uh, you should be able to show at least four different things in each category within those uh, positions. And here's what I mean. Escapes. I should be able to drop you into side control if you're a white belt, especially if you're a four-stripe white belt coming up on blue belt. This is not a one-stripe white belt. I should be able to put you in side control on the bottom and you should be able to show me four different ways of escaping side control. You should be able to show me four different ways of escaping mount. Why? Because one attack doesn't work against everybody. And sometimes it's the combination of you, you sell one escape, they defend, then you escape using a different pattern. So you should have four uh, escapes from mount, four escapes from side mount. You should know how to pass the guard in a variety of different ways. You should have a few different ways of escaping the back when someone has your, your back. In 
my lineage, we value headlock escapes as a white belt, uh, part of the white belt curriculum. And so for my students, they should be able to demonstrate four different headlock escapes. Why? Because headlocks are something that is very valuable as a self-defense tool, right? Someone puts you in a headlock, even if it's just one of those ugly, you know, backyard headlocks. The flip side of that is because you will have experience escaping headlocks, it means that offensively you're gonna to have to learn to you're gonna to have to learn to play the Keza Gatame position, the scarf hold position. Um, not all instructors really value that position. Some don't teach it hardly at all. I, I tend to teach it to my students because it's a great control position and you better know how to get out from those, uh, you know, from that position. Offensively, um, I expect my white belts to be able to show me four different arm locks from guard, from closed guard, right? You should be able to show a Kimura, you should be able to show a straight arm bar, you should be able to show maybe a telephone arm bar, you should be able to show, um, you know, a variety of, of, of arm bars from guard. You should be able to show four different chokes from guard. Uh, you should be able to show those things from mount, Americana, um, Kimura from mount, and so on. You should be able to show uh, a bunch of chokes from mount. You should be able to show a few different attacks from side control. You should be able to uh, show some attacks from the back, the rear naked choke, the bow and arrow choke, some arm bars, maybe a back triangle. That's the bread and butter uh, curriculum that I think every white belt should know. Uh, I would also encourage you and yeah, I encourage my white belts to understand how to escape neon belly. Neon belly can be a very dominant position. You should know how to escape neon belly. You should uh, also have some familiarity with half guard, not to a deep level, it's, but you should know what to do. If you're on the bottom in half guard, you, you should know that you need to get on your side, you need to get your frames, you need to get your control points. Uh, and offensively, you should know how to pass uh, half guard. Um, I also expect my white belts to know how to uh, perform the four most basic leg locks, straight ankle lock, toe press, toe hold, knee bar, um, uh, and, and heel hook. Maybe, maybe not a toe press, but at least you know four techniques from there. We don't necessarily let our white belts do heel hooks, uh, when they're sparring, but we certainly allow our white belts to drill all that stuff because you should be drilling it. The leg game is one of the more complex games in jiu-jitsu, and if you're not starting till you're a blue belt or beyond, well, you're behind the arc. So we let our white belts drill all that stuff. In addition, you should have some takedowns. You should, uh, you should know a few judo-style takedowns, maybe a seonagi, uh, an ogoshi, a hip throw, maybe an inside trip. You should also know a couple wrestling takedowns. You should be drilling single legs. You should be drilling double legs. Those are just uh, bread and butter techniques that every white belt should know. That's a lot. That is a lot. And if you're a new white belt, that might seem daunting. And it's true, you will learn more in your white belt journey, white belt to blue belt, than you will at any other phase of your jujitsu journey because you're having to learn big concepts. Eventually, the, the journey becomes one in which you're refining the things you know. It's one of refinement, but white to blue belt is about amassing. The analogy I use is a fisherman. You cast a net a big net because you're trying to catch as many fish as possible of different varieties. Eventually, you learn to use a, a rod and reel because you're trying to hone in on very, very specific techniques and, and get better. Uh, and that becomes the never-ending journey. As a black belt, you know, you're still trying to just shave off, you know, little impurities, you know, round the corners and, and make yourself more deadly effective. So that's a brief overview on what it means to be a white belt. Don't be frustrated if your 
offensive game is lagging behind. Because again, you need to master control before you're gonna be able to submit people reliably. Don't use that as a metric. Uh, how long does it take to earn a black or a blue belt? Uh, usually be from between a year and two years is pretty common. One year is uh, doable if you are training a lot, if you're reasonably athletic, if you're someone maybe that had some skills, some physical skills coming into this thing, maybe you were a wrestler, maybe, you, uh, maybe you're, you're ranked in another martial art, you can do it in a year. Uh, most people, you know, it takes maybe closer to a year and a half to two years. That's really common. Some people a little bit longer, especially if you're starting when you're older. If you're in your 40s and starting jujitsu, your journey is going to be a little bit longer. You don't have the mobility. You don't have the explosiveness. You don't have the power. You don't have, you know, a lot of the attributes that the younger athletes have that let them sort of, uh, you know, have success earlier than you might have success. So you're on, you know, you're, you're, you're only in competition with yourself. You are only in competition with yourself. You know, don't, don't compare yourself. Understand that it's gonna take you however long it takes you. Embrace the journey. That's the most important thing. Embrace the journey. If you're just chasing the belt, you're gonna burn out because it's hard. Embrace the fact that it's hard. Don't blow yourself out every night. You don't have to put a thousand percent energy into every role. You don't have to be as tense as a, you know, as a hard piece of wire. Try to be relaxed. Try to leave some fuel in the tank so you can come back and train more frequently. Frequency of training is much more important than intensity of training. And the earlier you can learn that, the better off you'll be. And if you're looking for an instructional resource to learn the white to blue curriculum, my recommendation is always Roy Dean's Blue Belt Requirements. It's the Bible. Uh, you can get that at his website or I'll put a link in the description below. So uh, congratulate yourself. You're doing something difficult. You'll, you're doing something that will change your life and has huge carryover into the rest of your life. The lessons you learn on the, the mat, the, the dynamic problem solving that you're engaged in, the, the being comfortable with discomfort, all these things will have huge carryover into the totality of your life. And one thing for sure, jujitsu will change you in positive ways. Nobody that has trained for any length of time will tell you that they haven't changed at all. They will all tell you that this has improved their life immeasurably. So stay on the journey, don't give up, you will get there and I applaud you and I hope this helps you in your journey. Take care.